just at a point now where I have confidence in what I can do. And I've been exposed to some phenomenal talent and how much more we do together. Sharing the failures gives the team a bit more confident that it's okay. I'd rather you move forward and make a decision because you did so based on the facts at hand. Whether it worked or not is a totally different story because if something didn't work, guess what? We're all going to learn from it. I finally have the confidence to be okay with my failures because it's always put me in a better position in the future. Welcome to the Data Chief. The Data Chief is a podcast for data and analytics leaders to share their personal stories and insights on technology, culture, and leadership. Every data professional will gladly discuss their big wins, but what about their big losses? How have career hiccups molded them into the leaders they are today and put them on a path to transform entire industries? Saul Rashidi is the Chief Analytics Officer at the Estee Lauder Company. Throughout her personal and professional life, Saul has used moments of uncertainty as opportunities for growth. Today, she is recognized as one of the top 50 most powerful women in tech. On this episode of The Data Chief, Saul joins Cindy for a candid conversation about how she uses challenging circumstances as fuel for further innovation and how she turns failures into valuable learning moments. Saul also takes a deep dive into the unique position of the CDO as both a business and a tech partner. Why data as a service for internal stakeholders is just as important as when designing consumer-facing data products, and why knowing your shelf life is one of the most valuable professional skills you can have. The Data Chief is presented by our friends at ThoughtSpot, the modern analytics cloud company. ThoughtSpot makes it easy for anyone to analyze your company's data with search and AI. Business people from companies like Walmart, Hulu, Schneider Electric, Cloud Academy, and Mercado use ThoughtSpot to quickly uncover new insights and turn them into action. You can learn more at ThoughtSpot.com. This week on The Data Chief, I am thrilled to have Saul Rashidi, the Chief Analytics Officer from Estee Lauder. Saul, welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. First, I have to say thank you, you know, for making such great products <laughs> for people like me. But um, also, where are you joining us from? I'm actually in Miami uh, at the this moment in time. I had the really fortunate opportunity of leaving New York City a few years ago, moving to Miami. The family absolutely loves it here. But of course, all my business is up in New York City. So I get to oscillate between the two amazing cities. Those are two amazing cities. Am I remembering? Are you in the Brickell area? Proper Miami Beach, actually. I am on the okay. Beach. You know, being a New Yorker, we're like, okay, if we're gonna make the move, let's let's be in the scene, if you will. So we found a great little residential area that's just tucked, and we're like a five minute Uber drive to anything major within Miami Beach, which is fantastic. Oh, it is beautiful. I love a beach anywhere, and yeah. <laughs> had the opportunity to visit there so many times while my. Daughter was in college down there. So yes, I think you have two of the best cities that you get to commute between. And one of the best global brands. So Estee Lauder, many of us think of the core brand, the makeup where it started, but Bobby Brown, Tommy Hilfiger, 150 countries around the world. Yeah, they've got some amazing brands from Tom Ford to Killian to Clinique to Origins, Aveda, Joe Malone. Like it's 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 wonderful to see how this company's grown and how strong their brand equity is and just the amazing products that they're putting out there that just make people happy. So it I'm I'm yeah. really excited. It's kind of a dream job for me. It's it's creative, but it's also in manufacturing and RD and marketing and product development. It's very consumer centric and, and it's a lot of martech opportunity. So it's it's just kind of an amalgamation of everything. And it's it's been it's great. It's been great. Yeah. So when I think about your long career in the data and analytics space, oftentimes we dive straight into your role, your current role, how you got here. But I want to go a little further back because Some of your earlier life um, events seem to be so foundational to having, I think, what is one of the toughest but most exciting jobs in our industry. And you have a strong athletic background as a water polo player at UC Berkeley. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's interesting. I uh, played water polo in high school. I actually didn't know how to swim when I started high school. 
And it was one of wow. the, my mother, Middle Eastern immigrants, like you need to do a sport. You need to be active. Didn't have much friends. And so I joined the swim team, but my coach was like, you don't know how to swim. So you're going to have to put extra hours before I can even allow you to be on the, not, not even the JV team. And so I just put in the extra hours and I learned how to swim. And then I started swimming faster and I picked up on my form and then I joined the JV team. But what ended up happening was, is I realized that water polo was too much of an individual sport. So you're part of a team, but it's still on you and your own successes are your successes, right? So it's great if the team wins a meet, but they only win if enough individuals win. And that just didn't drive too well. And I was really interested in water polo, but they didn't have a women's water polo team. So I actually played on the men's water polo team. That's when I discovered that I have a very strong competitive edge to me. I hated always being the last one to touch the end of a pool, the last one on the lap, the last one for the exercises. And I put in double time to get stronger and faster. And I think within a year and a half, I started swimming varsity. I was the um, number two state champion for, for butterfly. And I was playing water polo with the guys team. And that really set the stage for college. But the thing is, is you could be a phenomenal scholar athlete in high school and be barely mediocre, both in academics and in sports at the collegiate level. So even though I was training four or five hours a day and I had the work ethic and I was doing it, you know, my coach and I talked sophomore year and she's like, you're always going to be second string at best. So do you really want to continue putting in this time? Like, I love your work ethic. I love your tenacity. You show up every day, but you're just not naturally built for this. And there ah. was, yeah, I was five, three and the rest of my peers and teammates were like five, nine, five, 10 women. And she's like, you've relied on power to get you here, but you're at a point now where the caliber is just different. It's, it's a bunch of different dimensions coming together. Long story short, I actually ended up quitting water polo. And that same day I was walking down Bancroft way, a woman tapped me on the shoulder and said, what sport do you play? And I said, well, up until a few hours ago, I swam and played water polo. And she's like, have you ever tried rugby? I'm like, what the heck is rugby? She's like, yeah, the Americans view it as football without pads, but it's really internationally. Yes. And I'm like, why would women play rugby? She's like, we're starting a team. Uh, it just so happened that Cal um, has the number one men's team in the nation. They're investing in a women's team. And at the time, Title IX had kicked in. I think you'd be perfect for it. So I tried out. And this was kind of the start of everything. What was a weakness in one sport actually turned out to be my greatest asset in another sport. Because I was five, three and a half, my center of gravity was lower. It was harder to get me down so folks can tackle me. And because I'd learned speed and stamina with water polo, I was able to bring that on the field and out of the water. So I could move fast, but I was short and then sturdy so no one could take me down. And within a year, I was captain. And then I played on the national team. So it was sort of the first thing of like, know your shelf life quick enough in life and you could work hard on it. But if something's not sticking, you're not quitting. You just got to understand that this isn't my strength. I've optimized it as much as possible. There's potentially better situations where I can channel my energy, my purpose, my strengths, where I'll actually get the outputs I want. And that was just kind of the first light bulb and aha moment that happened. Yeah, that's both a heartbreaking story because I don't like that first coach that told you you're ne you're never going to make it, but then turning it into an opportunity. And I'm a USA certified swim official. So I'm picturing that you even played at that level, competed at that level, never having swum before high school is amazing. So this also tells me that you have quite a lot of grit and tenacity. And I feel the need to brag on you for a moment, if I may, because I know you're humble, as many leaders are, but you're one of the named one of the 50 most powerful women in tech, one of the top 20 CDOs. You hold 21 patents. File Did 21. You, oh, <laughs> file 21. Okay. We just Yes, but I just got news. The eighth one was granted yesterday. Okay. It just came in and I opened it up and I'm like, what's this? So the good news is eight of the 21 have been granted, but yes. So eight patents. And, and I would say you're at the middle of your career and you've accomplished so much. So were you always this way or was it a shaping of some of the, the hard truths that you faced in college? I think it was some of the hard truths. I think I was a very bashful kid growing up. I didn't have the confidence. I was always the one trying to figure out where my footing was. I didn't have a group. I floated amongst many groups, which means that I'm not really belonging to one. But I think, you know, to me, what Mo had said was like, you're just always going to be second string. And that's the reality of it. Like, 
you decide what you want to do. I'm happy to have you on the team because you're fun, great for morale. Your work ethic is there. You actually show others not to quit. But if you're really looking at outputs and results, is this the best use of your time? And she just laid it out for me. So I had tremendous respect for her. And I've been very fortunate. I've had people tell me that along the way, and it's helped me think about where I want to be and where I want to be positioned. You know, nowadays, I think some people view it as criticism or they view it as an insult. It's not. If you actually have someone who cares enough about you, they're going to be honest with you and go, you've got a lot to provide and to give, but where you're channeling your energy isn't going to be where you're going to get the most output from. So let's take that raw talent. Let's take that grit. Let's take that hustle. Let's take that aptitude and let's apply it somewhere where you can shine because you have all the raw ingredients. So I've had, um, you know, Mo, if you will, from water polo, Kathy from rugby, Jay Bellissimo from SAP, Jay Schneider from Royal Caribbean, Leffler from SAP days, rest in peace. It just some great individuals where all it took was one or two conversations that made me completely pivot my way of thinking. And I was like, okay, I got it now. Now it's on me to do something about it. You know, today's world's a little bit different though. Not everyone's open to hearing that feedback. I think where I just hesitate is, do, do we know at what point in time do we know you should pivot or work harder? I mean, I, I would look at Aaron Rodgers from football who, who never got a D1 offer. Imagine if he had listened yeah. to that one coach that told him to give up too soon. So it's more that. You mentioned something that I'd like to explore a little bit. You said that you gravitated between groups. And when I've heard you speak about the chief data and analytics officer role, you referred to it as an outsider, mm -hmm. not neatly fitting in one bucket. So does this relate? It's a good point. I never thought about that. But as a chief data officer, chief analytics officer, chief data and analytics officer, it's a new role, which in and of itself has its complications and challenges. Yes. But it's also within a domain that everyone and no one touches it and owns it. And so your ability to communicate, your ability to oscillate between conversations, your ability to pivot across different problems, it has to be there. But imagine most of the time this role sits within the business, but you're not running a PL and a brand. So you're never really one of them but you represent them and you're honestly a service support so that if they're responsible for increasing market share, if they're responsible for diversifying their portfolio and trying to understand different markets to get into, if they're responsible of how to prioritize the funding and the resources that have been given to them, if they're responsible for the market is shifting, let's figure out what the signals are, that's their business. And you have to provide the data, the analytics, the insights to help them get to that. So you're really a service provider at this point in time. So you're not really one in the business, but you have to know the business as well as them so that when they have concerns, you understand why. And you bring that into solutioning. But most of what our space does is very technical, very technical. Yes. Take a look at the back end ecosystem versus the front end ecosystem, whether it's ETLs, data migrations, data warehouses, data marts, standing up lakes, infosec, data management services, taking a services approach architecture, like you've got to know about all of that and the different plays that you can take depending on the priorities. And then you've got to have the front end. All right, so how do we run the models? How do we package and containerize our models so that we can actually put them in products? How do we develop digital products that actually shows the insights that the businesses can make quicker decisions with? So the breadth, depth, and span of knowledge is quite vast, but the underlying premise is technology. Now imagine you're in the business bringing technical acumen and ways of addressing their problems and giving them the insights faster. But to deploy those solutions, you have to have one a heavy technology and development arm. Some cases I've had ownership of that arm end to end. And in other cases, I've had to partner with different departments, whether it's the digital department or the IT department, but we're all tech. Tech is a multidisciplinary field and it must be to make sure that we're sufficiently looking forward. It's no longer just the business of IT. But now imagine I'm working with different tech partners and I don't care what team you sit in. Well, some are used to having that ownership end to end. And now you've got another group. We may not be wide, but we're narrow and very, very deep. So while I may understand tabular schemas in a database, it doesn't mean I'm a database administrator. So 
when I talk about our area, it does cross over into other tech teams and that you're not, but you're not really one of them because you still sit in the business. So oftentimes my role is that when I say the awkward Venn diagram business, whatever we call it or tech, and we straddle both. So we really don't have a home in either area in either place. So it can be fun, but it can be challenging as well. And it takes a while for folks to get used to it. Yeah. This is where I've said, I find this role, both the best role because you certainly don't get bored. You can go as wide <laughs> and as deep as you want, but it's also sometimes the worst job, maybe because it's that lack of sense of home or you get caught in the middle. You also referred to the deep domain expertise. And I look at your career, Royal Caribbean, Sony, Estee Lauder, um, management consulting, How have you been able to pivot and keep up with these different domains? Yeah. So I would say the first year is always a massive sprint. Like it's not even hit training. It's not CrossFit. It's a sprint for the first year because I love the cross industry work. Oddly enough, the problems are always the same, but there's a learning curve with knowing the business stakeholders and the decision makers and those that are vocal and those that aren't the type of culture you're stepping into. Then there's a learning curve with the industry and how businesses run. Then there's a learning curve with the vernacular and the acronyms that are used internally. And then there's a learning curve with understanding what's going well, what's not going well, and where there's opportunities to improve, and then pulling all that together into a strategy and a structure and a potential scope for the team, and then outlining the operating model of how we're going to work with all the other businesses. So the first year is completely a sprint, but the environments that I look to get into is, you know, I was with Royal and Sony Music, a very short stint at Merck, um, and then at Estee Lauder. I've learned that for me, the the secret sauce is I actually really love being in a creative environment. It's really, really cool. But when you're in creative environment, by default, that means that certain processes that you think were in place, like aren't. Yeah. Certain structure that you think is in (laughs) place is not. They're more flexible. They're more creative about processes. Very different from German and manufacturing. Correct. Or or the Japanese operating model, right? Yes. And there's hierarchies and like, you know, it's, it's, so it's different. But I do love the creative environment. And so part of my job is bringing that process and structure. And you can imagine folks see the benefit in a year, but during that year, it's really uncomfortable. And some go, oh, I totally see this. This makes perfect sense. How are we not doing this three years ago? And others, you know, they they resist and they don't get it and they don't understand it. And it takes them longer to process what's happening. So every experience has been really different. But the thing that I look for is I love a creative environment. And working with a technical team that at least has a forward vision of where they want to go and a sense of urgency. There are certain industries, and I'm not going to mention them, where I've legitimately said, by the time I get them up to date, I'm going to be outdated. And I've left fairly quickly. Yeah, I think that's great. You have to take that into consideration because the pace of change is the slowest it's ever going to be in this moment in time. And Moore's law is 100%. In fact, everything is exponentially speeding up. And so we can't keep up with everything that's out there. Um, That's hard enough as it is. But to get an entire technical team to get there, that's really difficult. So part of it is also making sure you're a part of a team or you have partners who are forward thinking. They may not know the how, but at least they have the the what and the purpose and their heart of hearts and collectively you can work towards that. And your point about now is the slowest time. A number of CDOs at visionary companies or innovative companies have repeatedly said that in the last year when already I think people the last year have felt like, wait, our digital transformation we accomplished in a year, what we thought would take 10, our move to the cloud, we planned for three years and we did it in eight months. And the, the new thinking is it's not just about upskilling because mm-hmm. we don't know what the next skills are. It's And really being agile in your skill building is key. Do you agree with that? 100%. 100%. I think a few dimensions and facets have to come into place. Of course, talent is key. There's no doubt about it. Talent is everything. The second, I would say, is the propensity or the um, aperture of the company and being tech-centric. There's a difference between wanting to be and then providing the services and creating the runway to be. Mm -hmm. 
Now, the pace at which we do it could be a different story and where he prioritizes different, but at least there's a propensity and sort of propelling it forward. And the third is, is understanding where the source of margins come from. If you have a company where margins are kind of locked because you own a patent, there's something proprietary, that's a perfect recipe for complacency because there's no sense of urgency to continue to maintain your current stronghold or grow your existing positioning with the marketplace. And it's, we'll get there when we get there, but right now we're financially doing really well. Yeah. That creates, creates just a level of laziness. But if you're in an industry where there's always competition, you meet individuals and you meet departments and functional groups and tech teams where they're like, no, we got to keep going. Like we can't stop. Yeah. Yeah. I've often said that you need a degree of pain to force you <laughs> to innovate <laughs> or you're just, you're, you're never willing to settle for good enough for the status quo. But the other thing that you have brought to many of your roles is this product centric mindset, data products and design thinking. Tell us how you apply that and what this means. My love of that fell in place, I would say in 2016, 17. So we built the entire data backend ecosystem, but with the vision of data as a service. And this was back in 2016, 17. And the service we were providing, the vision was, is we were going to be a service provider to the digital team. So whatever web app or mobile app or whatever app they're developing, we would provide APIs from the data environment that we built. So we had a data ecosystem we put in place. We were going to develop endpoints for them to leverage and all the products that they needed to leverage then the second was really around our right, data science and advanced analytics. We were going to provide an environment so that they can do their ad hoc queries. They can run their ML, algor um, ML algorithms. They had an area to train and model. We were going to provide a service also to containerize those models so that we can put them into production in the different apps. But then there was also operational reporting. So we figured out who our end users were going to be. And we're like, what product do we need to develop to make sure that those end users get what they need? And... Back then, my scope was limited more towards the backend ecosystem, and it was really focused on data as a service. But that's when I realized the power of a product. We could clearly articulate what we were developing and for who and by when and what the outcomes were. So we were able to measure both subjectively um, and objectively uh, the, the commercial components, the convenience components, et cetera. But then it pivoted and I actually love developing the front end and that's where the creativity kicked in. So now we're building the back end ecosystem to hydrate and power all the front end applications and apps that we were building that was meant to deliver data at your fingertips so that the different business decisions or business executives can make the business decisions quick, fast way, but also kind of impress some folks so like, here, wait, I have an app. Let me show you how we're doing globally. Oh, you had a question around Germany? Actually, let me show you what's going on. So Australia and Japan are doing this, but Western Europe is doing this. We should change our tactic around marketing. And it was all around data at your fingertips. So it went from data as a service to now uh, my, my next role being data at your fingertips and data as a service. And then now it's, it's morphed into, I don't have responsibilities for the backend data ecosystem, but now I have responsibilities for data architecture, enterprise data management, uh, master data management, ensuring that the data is whole, and then working in tandem with the partners to develop an ecosystem where data can be a service, but we have responsibilities for data at your fingertips. So it's oscillated, it's been slightly different, but in all of that, unless you take a product-centric approach and unless you treat your own internal um, folks as your consumers, or even the external folks as consumers, it's really difficult to be able to measure and get any sort of adoption. So taking a product approach has really helped with that. Yeah. So let me clarify a couple things here, Saul. So was this, you said this was about five years ago. Was this when you were at Royal Caribbean? Yeah. Well, the first take was at Watson. Okay. That was product development. When Watson beat Ken Jennings in 2011, IBM essentially said, okay, we're ready to go to market. Let's get a team in place. Let's commercialize the concepts, the, the framework, that we have in place. And all of it was run, most of it was run out of Austin and some of it was run out of New York. And so they were ready to go to market with this. And so a part of that is developing the products that these massive corporations could use. So we were democratizing AI for enterprise use. What does it mean? Well, no one knew. 
we were developing it for the first time. So it was talking to the clients, understanding the art of the possibility, committing to a small scope. So I say, think big, start small, and then we'll scale quickly. What's that start small? Let's get an MVP out the door. So we were developing the product while doing POCs to understand that ultimately what the market was demanding and for us to develop a suite of products that would be Watson for the future. That was sort of my training wheels. And, and then that, like, that was really cool. And then I switched over, went to EY, had a short stint there where Royal was my client. But from there is where that product mindset kicked in. I would just say the roots continue to get deeper with every single position. Right. Okay. Thank you. And then you use the term data as a service, which many people think about this in terms of data monetization for external data apps. Yeah. But the way you described it was really data as, as a service for your internal stakeholders as well. Did I get that right? 100%. Yes. Yeah. That's where the concept started because external facing apps are great for the consumers. No doubt about that. But most enterprises and corporations are starving for the insights internally. It's not always necessarily about the product that's being developed to the consumer because we wouldn't have the insights as to what to develop, when to develop, what affiliate or market to release it in, what's the timing, what's the sequence, inventory management, demand planning, like all of that, our own internal folks need to have this information. So 100% on external, like super fan of external facing consumer products. But our internal folks are missing that. Uh, oh, absolutely. Just, hey, yeah. How do we take something that's in a tabular form, columns and rows, pie charts and bar charts, and make it come to life so it makes sense to them without someone walking them through it? Yeah. I mean, BI adoption rates are abysmal when I look at an industry that is twenty more than 20 years old, 25, 27 years now. Um, and, and so you also are willing to talk about your failures. When did this philosophy not play out or was it before you had this product mindset? I think I'm just at a point now where I have confidence in what I can do. And I've been exposed to some phenomenal talent and how much more we do together that I think, to be honest with you, um, sharing the failures gives the team a bit more confident that it's okay. I'd rather you move forward and make a decision because you did so based on the facts at hand. Whether it worked or not is a totally different story because if something didn't work, guess what? We're all going to learn from it. I'd rather you try than not try. I'd rather you overreach than sit and wait until an email comes to you to take action. And so sometimes I think for me, I finally have the confidence to be okay with my failures because it's always put me in a better position in the future. But to sharing that, I hope the teams that I manage or lead or potential talent that I recruit knows that I'm okay if we didn't do well. What I'm not okay with is the fact that we wait for something to happen to us to take action. And I always say, are you a thermometer or a thermostat? Are you going to read the temperature in the room or are you going to change the temperature in the room? For me, that's super, super key. I'm okay making mistakes if you tried something. What I'm not okay is not trying something and then blaming others for the mistakes or not trying something and then pointing out all the issues that can go wrong. Like that to me is just, it's, it's, it's a big no-no on the team. But if you're proactive and you're trying something new and it doesn't go as well, kudos to you. Now, what have we learned? And let's take that for the next thing that you're going to try and do. And so part of the, the failure sharing is aha moments for me and the team, but two, to also let them know that it's okay to try. Yeah. So, so fail fast and learning. I'm just chuckling here, Saul, because you are always so quotable. You come up with the, <laughs> these great taglines. Are you a thermometer or are you a thermostat? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure I bug my team with all the analogies and the metaphors, but no, I'm, I'm thinking of it, of another tagline you used. Are you a GSD or I think you're going to have to, you're going to have to explain what this is. So a girlfriend of mine, you know, like there's, there's, I've been so fortunate for having some amazing women in my life and I'm a part of some different organizations, you know, so whether it's Cindy or ARPA or Asha, you know, they're like, it, I know phenomenal women who are in major positions and um, the one thread that we have in common amongst many things is we're all GSDers. Let's get SHIT done. <laughs> like, so it's okay. You have spelled it. Name. We yeah. can leave that. <laughs> it, it's um, PMP, MBA, but I'm like, the one that I care about is GSD. Like, great that you have green belt, black belt, 
Six Sigma, fine. Great that you're PMP, fine. Great that you're PhD, fine. What matters to me is the GSD. Are you yeah. a person who naturally just wants to get stuff done and be a part of a legacy or not? And if you're not, that's okay. But let's call a spade a spade and we'll, we'll find positions for you that'll leverage where you are in your life. But there's some of us that just has still have fire in our bellies and we want to be a part of a story and we want to be a part of something. And we have things that we can refer to from five years ago, four years ago, three years ago, the patents that are coming through across me and the my teammates who I've worked with several years ago. We were a part of a story and we can remember all the late nights, burning the wick at both ends getting frustrated with each other, but then having drinks with each other, not taking anything personal and just knowing that this is part of the growing pains and not everyone's going to be besties from day one. But at the end of the journey, you're going to look back and go, holy cow, that was an amazing ride. And I tend to gravitate towards GSDers because there's just that natural language, that natural tempo. And so a lot of the positions that I hold, it's like, listen, we've had a few failed attempts in the past. We need to we need to get it right now. Or yeah. this is our first attempt, but we're not an organization that does well with change. So we need individuals that have that backbone and not a wishbone and our GSD years and are going to rally the troops together. And, and so those are the types of positions that I naturally gravitate towards. And then the, and the executives that I naturally gravitate towards and the teammates that I naturally gravitate towards, because we just kind of want to be a part of something. Yeah, I like it. There you go. Backbone, not a wishbone. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you also, you you referred to a, a group. So if I can mention this group that you're also a founding member of, WILDA, or Women Leaders in Data and Analytics. Tell us why you wanted to be one of the founding members of this group. So I refer to an individual named um, Asha Saksani, and she she found a few of us. And she says, listen, I have an idea. I have a vision. I need some strong women to come together and put this together. But more importantly, there's just stuff that we as female executives go through that I don't think people still are aware that it's it's alive and well. It's gone from sort of conscious, aggressive place to subconscious, aggressive place to now passive resistance place. It's still there. It, yes. Oh, I know. <laughs> I'll, I'll never forget. And, and I won't mention the firm that I was a part of. And it wasn't long ago. Two examples that came to mind. There, we were all on a call. And I remember a, a, a male gentleman had spoken out loud and he was loud and demanding. And, and it, like there was just passion, right? And he was like full force. And then he said, And by the way, I've got to get off the call because I got to go pick up my son at 3 30. And it was on a Friday. And when he dialed off, like I saw, you know, everyone on the Slack channel talking, like, you know, really like him as a leader. He's, he's super motivated, super driven, and what a family guy. I remember a call I had a week after. Same context, same audience, same group, but one of the female executives had spoken. And she had a very clear vision. She had a very clear, precise understanding of what it needed to happen, by whom, and when. And she put timelines in place. And she'd also say, and by the way, I need to get off the call around 4.30 because I got to go pick up my son from camp. And the messages were, here she goes. She's on her soapbox again. She's too strong. She's so aggressive. You know, she always has to pick up her kid at 430. She really committed. Same contact. Yes. But the lens was very different. And so these are things that we just naturally go through that I don't think people pick up on. And now it's so subtle and it's in the form of resistance or exclusion from meetings that I don't think people are quite getting it. So me, Asha pulled a, a bunch of us together and I was very fortunate. And we kind of talk that the, the world that we're in today, the pace of change that we're in today, what's considered success, some of the subconscious biasness that goes into some of those conversations, how we could be perceived and how to let women know that it's quite all right because you're competent and because you have a point of view, you're going to get yeah. perspectives, right? It, it's okay. And so I think her come, making that vision come to life has been fantastic. And I just wanted to be a part of it. I think it was, a, it's just yeah. a great story. It's a great company. It's a great organization. Yeah, it's a great organization. And yeah, I think this is where all of us that are at this level and in this space, you do have a backbone because um, it's, and a thick yeah. skin is what 
the AI leader at Verizon refers to, I think it's important. I want to do a hard pivot because another thing that you are passionate about, you talked about the breadth and the depth of skills that you need also in the technology side. And you recently referred to how in a way it's gotten harder when we look at the data lake house yeah. the data fabric, um, data warehouses. We have Snowflake and Databricks duking it out. We have Starburst <laughs> data with their new approach coming from uh, the Presto world. Tell us your thinking. One, how do you keep up with this? And then two, if you want to make a prediction, what's going to happen here? Do organizations have to have a dual strategy or place their bets in one area? Really good question. If someone's cracked this nut, I think I'd love to sit with them and just take notes and listen. Yeah. I mean, Cindy, no different than you, right? It's, it's, we have to do our homework. We have to do our research. Part of it's based on our network of like, what's the difference between the Delta Lake, the Lake House and the Cloud Lake of the different vendors? Because for some reason, yeah. House, Cloud, Delta, Lake. I'm like, okay. Okay, so, Delta Lake <laughs> Databricks. <laughs> Let, let's associate the marketing yes. terms. Yeah, data with the cloud, right vendor. So, yeah, Data Cloud Snowflake Coin. I'm like, I didn't know you could do yes. that. It's hilarious. Great marketing. <laughs> and, I, and I love the team that I've worked with over there, and I do love the company. Um, yeah. But even like Delta Lake, Lake House, Databricks, got it. If you take a look at the stack across AWS, GCP, Azure, that gets super confusing as well. And for me, like... This may be an incorrect approach, just my personal perspective. Everyone has the bells and whistles and the features and functionalities, but the maturity of where they are in the product roadmap and development is what slightly differs. Yes. So for me, I'm not married to any one particular company per se, because my scope constantly changes depending on my position and my company. But the problems that we need to solve for then and there, the jobs to be done, Well, I would love to do some early experimentation and be an early adopter with some tangential things that isn't necessarily part of my scope, but I know will be or will be a concern in two to three years, would love to do that. But for the job that needs to be done now and for the scope at hand, who has the greatest maturity and the who's the greatest enabler for my team, my talent to be to do to do their jobs. And I think everything's an option at this point in time. I just want to know, I know you have this. I want to know where in your product roadmap is the maturity level of what you have. Because if you're going to market saying you have this, that's great. Are you an alpha, beta? Is it productionalized? And if it's productionalized, is it MVP one? That's probably not where I want to start with a capability or a competency that's existed for six years. And I can go to another vendor. Legitimately, that's all they've been doing for six years. Because guess what? They've already gone through all the lessons learned. So I'm not going to sign up for this service because we have an enterprise agreement with you. I will sign up for this service if you've been doing it for as long as I needed you to do it, because it's a fully mature capability that we now need to leverage to drive this capability that my team needs to build. So for me, it's all about where they are in the product roadmap and what makes the most sense to be efficient with delivery. Um, For good or for bad, I am very results-oriented and output-driven. I like this results oriented and maturity, but let me push back here because as we said earlier, now is the slowest point in time. So it used to be easier to say who's mature and who's innovating faster. So what would be your time horizon then? So with most enterprises, I would say you've got 12 to 16 months to put something on the map. So you have to decide are you going to partner with someone who just figured this out a year ago and is getting into the business? Or are you going to partner with someone who's been doing this for five to six years? Because either it was their core business and then they just diversified, or this is legitimately thing, the only thing that they do. They've gone through all the lessons learned. They've gone through all the failures. I'd rather not do it on, on, on my dime with the corporation at this moment in time when they're already four years behind what they needed right. to have. Yeah. So if it's a situation where it's fundamental, it's foundational, we need to get the company to catch up. I'm going to look for a partner who legitimately does this day in and day out. That's all they love, eat and breathe. But if it's a capability that's very forward looking, then I'm willing to experiment because that's where some of the creative components come in and things that we didn't even think about. So I think you have to decide ultimately what's the scope at hand. If it's a foundational element that should have been put in place and isn't, 
or if it's a new capability and then fairly provocative in the marketplace. If it's foundational and they should have had it several years ago, I always go with the trusted provider. If it's forward-looking and innovative, I don't really like using that word, then I'm willing to experiment with a lot of the boutique agencies um, that are coming out with some great ideas because I know that they're hungry. I know that they're going to make themselves available. Um, and I know that they're willing to experiment with us because that whole that whole train track or swim lane is experimentation. Right. And so given how quickly things are changing, what do you most read, listen to? How do you keep up? I'm always behind. I have an entire <laughs> folder like on my uh, browser of things to read, things to catch up on. And then I have an entire folder of files that are sent to me, studies that are sent to me that I catch up on. So I've kind of built a little bit of a routine and regimen. I wake up between 4.45 and 5 a.m. every single day. It's unfortunate, but that's what's happening. I happen to have two young kids too that also wake up at seven. So from 4.45 to 5.45, cup of coffee, wake up, and that's when I read. It's everything's clear. I'm not being bombarded with texts, WhatsApp, Slack, Teams, email. It's, it's just fresh. And that's when I absorb the most. And I'm a dork. I highlight, I take notes. I transcribe what I read into a notebook. I actually have a notebook of all the notes that I've taken of everything I've ever read for the past like three years. What a great discipline. It's the only way, you know how it is. Like I'm in my four, yeah. my memory's kind of slipping. If I don't write it down, it slips. So reading and highlighting is one form of absorb absorption, but describing it into a notebook is another. And then I can always go back to a single spot when I'm like, wait, what was the takeaway from that? What did they just share about virtualization? Um, hold on. What's that component within a services-based architecture that they were talking about? Like what type of endpoints should we explore? I always have my notebook to go back to, but that's my reading time. It also means I'm perpetually behind because I have an hour to do that. Then I'll say about 5.45 to 6.30, it's catch up on morning emails, drink a cup of coffee, then it's workout, get kids ready. Luckily, I have a very supportive husband. He helps with the children a ton. And then the work starts from eight to whenever. So you can imagine that morning quiet time to read is only about an hour in the morning and there's no way to catch up on the Harvard Business Reviews, the Gartner Reports, the Databricks, Snowflake Publications, the let me take a look at that webinar that I missed, but now I have a video recording that I can go back to. It's it's Yeah, sounds like a great routine. So I feel like we we could just spend so much time here, but I, I always like to end with one question or I'll give you a choice here. If you think about something in the last year that just made you laugh out loud, belly laugh, because I think we all need a little more humor, laughter, or what are you most grateful for? We were in the middle of COVID and I don't think, I don't know if everyone experiences at a certain point in time where you just kind of lose it a little bit because we weren't used to working from home and it was just a different. And for those of us who are constantly used to flying, I remember going to the grocery store and I was not aware, like it was just t-shirt and shorts, but one foot had a sandal. The other one had flip flops and I was just very disoriented and I'm, and I'm usually pretty polished. And I went to the grocery store and came back and was not even phased. And I walked through the door and my husband looks at me and he's like, what happened? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, did you get robbed? I'm like, no, what do you mean? <laughs> he's like, you've got your hair in a scrunchie and you're wearing two different shoes. And I looked down and said, holy crap, I'm losing myself. <laughs> I've lost it. <laughs> like, I need to get, I need to just do something different. I have totally lost it. And he took a picture, of course. So now it's always like, if you piss me off, I'm going to blackmail you. And I'm saying this to all of our friends. Um, so that was a great chuckle. Just in general, when, when we kind of lose ourselves, we're not paying attention to the little details and the subtleties. But what I'm grateful for is when that event happened, um, I started paying attention to the details and the subtleties. I started paying attention to the weather and how the sun started reflecting, my kids watching them grow. Um, my youngest is three and a half. My oldest just turned six. Watching and hearing their vocabulary and their context and their sense of humor having the opportunity to join Estee Lauder, a phenomenal, phenomenal brand, having the opportunity to work with teammates of mine that worked with me at Royal and at Sony Music and now with me at Estee Lauder and getting that chemistry back together. I'm grateful for being able to see other people in Zoom and having their light bulbs click. Like, I'm happy where I'm at. This is a good story. This is a good vision. I'm happy to be honest with you that in the middle of the COVID, our family was not impacted. 
our friends were not. Yeah, connected. yeah, absolutely. Um, and more so importantly, good. I'm happy to meet people like you and, you know, Arpa and Aisha and Cindy and a lot of strong women who are in our position. And there's a great network out there. And, you know, we, we all kind of need friends. So there's yeah. grateful for that's so beautifully said, Saul. So you've made us laugh, and <laughs> I'm grateful that you took the time to be with us on the Data Chief today. Thank you, Saul. I really appreciate it, Cindy. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Data Chief. To learn more about today's guest, recommend a future guest, or hear more of the show, head over to thedatachief.com. If you have questions for Cindy or comments about the episode, give her a shout by dropping your thoughts on LinkedIn and tagging Cindy Housen. Join her on LinkedIn Live the first Thursday of each month for a live version of The Data Chief, where she'll share best practices and take your questions live. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the show. Every review helps more people discover the podcast and helps us improve our content. The Data Chief is brought to you by our friends at ThoughtSpot, the modern analytics cloud company. Finding insights in your company's data doesn't have to be complicated. All you need is search. With ThoughtSpot, anyone in your organization can easily answer their own data questions, find facts, and make better, faster decisions. Learn more at ThoughtSpot.com.